So I don't know about you guys, but I feel like the church has a really weird relationship with this passage. It just makes us really uncomfortable. Which makes a certain amount of sense, right? The church has come a long way from being a persecuted minority sect in the first century. As an institution, we have now more everything. More political power, more economic power, more social power. So Jesus telling off a rich guy doesn't sit particularly comfortably. Growing up across a couple of denominational contexts, what I remember being taught about this passage was that, was that it was really about how you felt about your belongings and that Jesus needed to matter to you in your heart more than material things. You needed to know in your heart that if Jesus came to you right now and asked you, you would give up everything you have, but you didn't actually need to do anything or change anything about your life. And as I was preparing for this sermon, it was funny and maybe a little bit sad uh, how many commentaries like beg you as a preacher to resist the temptation to soften this story, to avoid making it metaphorical, to avoid spiritualizing it, to take the text seriously, to take Jesus seriously. And there's a version of this story in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. It's made its way into three of the four gospels. Clearly the early church thought it was important. It's so easy for us to get distracted by the dramatic metaphor. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to fit where? Or intimidated by the unequivocal denunciation of wealth. But when we get to the heart of it, at its core, this story is a call narrative. It follows the same pattern of the calling of the disciples that we can see in Mark chapters one and two. Jesus encounters somebody, instructs them to abandon their current way of life and calls them to follow him. But the difference in those stories that we know so well is that they actually do it. They follow the call, they join Jesus in his ministry. Across the gospels, the rich man is the one example we have of a call narrative that falls flat on its face, where the outcome is not this person stopped what they were doing immediately to follow Jesus. Instead, the rich, way, the rich man walks away, grieving and shell-shocked. But situations where things don't quite follow the script where our expectations are disappointed or things don't work out, can be, the, can be the most powerful in revealing the truth in a new or a different light. So tonight, I want us to reflect on this particular story with two lenses. What Jesus was calling this man from and what Jesus was calling this man to. Let's start with the from. When the, when the rich man approaches Jesus, there is this immediate tension. He runs up, kneels before Jesus, and practically begs, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think when we know our Bible story as well, it's really easy for us to judge the characters and be a little bit dismissive because we know their roles. So we're a bit like, oh yeah, like that rich dude who couldn't get his shit together, that guy, we know that guy. But to me, looking back at this text, his desperation feels genuine, it's palpable. He knows that something is missing. He knows that despite a lifetime of striving, he isn't where he needs to be or wants to be with God. But at that exact same moment, he's also betraying the worldview that has him trapped. He asks Jesus what he needs to do to inherit eternal life, as if it's no different from any other possession he might obtain. The theologian Shed Myers emphasizes that the Greek word for inherit in this passage has the same connotations for us as modern readers as it did in the Greek, to receive property through having it passed down. So the English translation isn't editorializing here. Shed Myers also offers us insight into the economic system of the time, explaining that land ownership was the basis of wealth and there was a small class of people that held land. And land ownership was usually consolidated and expanded through the usual suspects, right? So marriage, political alliances, patronage. But also at this stage of history in first century Palestine, economic inequality was on the rise. Small agricultural landholders were losing their land because of debt that they couldn't repay, which was something that we see referenced in other gospel stories. And when they lost their land, it would be absorbed into the larger estates of the wealthy. It's pretty likely that this rich man benefited from these very circumstances, and it was at least part of the reason why he possessed so much. 
So the rich man using the term inherent so thought thoughtlessly, claiming that he'd kept the law without any acknowledgement of potentially falling short, especially given the exploitation that this system required. The way that he speaks betrays his sense of entitlement. In the passage, we also see the rich man's sense of obedience and deference. His claim to have followed the commandments since his youth, his deference towards Jesus, kneeling before him, calling him good teacher. There's nothing inherently wrong with these actions in themselves, but there is a reason why Jesus immediately challenges them, first on his use of the word good, and then by urging him to give up his wealth. Jesus recognises that this man is driven by obedience to and valorization of systems of power, power through wealth, power through religious authority. But Jesus also sees this man's earnestness, his genuine desire for God. And it's Jesus' love and compassion for this man that makes Jesus offer him a way out of these traps that he's ensnared in. We should also pay attention to the fact that this value system is clearly like not unique to the rich man, right? We can see from the disciples' reactions how fundamental it was to the worldview at the time. They're astounded and horrified by what Jesus is saying. They still believe their society's cultural myths that wealth and prosperity were indications of God's blessing. So what Jesus is saying to them is borderline incomprehensible. It should be easiest for these people who are so blessed, right? Who can be saved if the blessed can't? Jesus has to like triple down with an absolutely wild camel analogy for the disciples to seriously start to reckon with the things that he's saying. So if Jesus is calling the rich man away from upholding and obedience to systems of power, particularly through wealth, but also through religion, what is Jesus calling him to instead? This is partially revealed through Jesus' conversation with the disciples after the rich man has left. After they get over their immediate shock, Peter reflects that the disciples have, in fact, left everything that they knew to follow Jesus. And Jesus acknowledges this, saying, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus is saying that the sacrifice that discipleship requires doesn't go, um, I don't want to say unrewarded, because it's not like getting a prize, um, but that the sacrifices are recognised and other blessings are offered in multitudes. Now, I want to be really clear, this is less about like individual accumulation uh, of things to replace what's been given up, but instead a recognition that discipleship is a calling into community, and community where people care about each other and share what they have offers so much more than any one person could ever give up. And in the second list of blessings, the father figure is excluded, which we could also see as pushing back against another system of power, the patriarchal family structure. It implies that instead, God is the sole figure of authority in the kingdom of God, and existing powers will not have authority. The second list also includes persecutions, notably absent from the first list. The sacrifice that characterizes that initial calling into discipleship is not an aberration or a fluke, and it's not a one and done. Jesus is saying that discipleship is not easy, that by turning our back on these systems to follow him, we're exposed to the punishment, harm, and sometimes even violence of these systems because of our rejection of them. Discipleship is characterized as much by this persecution as it is by the blessings that Jesus lists. And if we zoom out to the passages surrounding this story, we see even more context for this. The story of the rich man is the second of three, which one after the other show the heart of the kingdom of God and the call of discipleship. In the passage immediately before this story, the disciples tell people off for bringing their children to Jesus, and Jesus rebukes them and says, actually, the kingdom of God belongs to children. And children are in any society amongst the most vulnerable. And in a society where patriarchal family systems are the norm, children have the least power and safety in that structure. And then immediately after today's passage, Jesus and the disciples continue their journey towards Jerusalem. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection, and then James and John start a kerfuffle amongst the disciples because they ask to be appointed at Jesus' left and right hand when he enters his glory. 
And Jesus has to explain to them that it's not about lording over each other, but in actual fact that whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave to all. So there's a theme here, repeated in back-to-back stories across different contexts, in the social sphere, in the economic sphere, in the political sphere. The kingdom of God means that the powerful and the affluent will be put last, and the most vulnerable will be protected and exalted. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And if we put all of this in the context of where we are in Mark's gospel right now, Jesus and the disciples traveling towards Jerusalem, Jesus is literally on his way to the cross. And it's close, like the next chapter is Palm Sunday. Which brings us back to the persecutions that are inherently a part of discipleship because of the ways that it poses and creates conflict with prevailing systems of power. Knowing the risk involved, the call is still to reject these systems, to follow Jesus, to share in community, and to serve others. So, for us as disciples here in this time and this place, what are we called from and what are we called to? Our modern world and the value that we put on wealth and power certainly has parallels to what we see in scripture. Do we have to give up all our possessions to follow Jesus? Not necessarily. This story was never a universal call to give up all that you own. But I do think that we need to take this story seriously. We are called away from relying on and committing ourselves to systems of wealth and power, and instead called to a discipleship committed to following Jesus in community and with hearts centered on service. Similarly to the lectionary reading from last week, and in case you weren't here, it involved chopping off body parts that are leading you to sin. Um, I think that we're called to a serious and sober accounting of our lives, considering what brings us closer to Christ and deepens our discipleship, and what doesn't, and removing those things which don't allow us to be faithful disciples. As with everything, it's easier said than done. But that's why Jesus reminds his disciples and reminds us that all things are possible with God. We're not relying solely on our own efforts. And I think it's also worth remembering that Jesus looks at the rich man with love and compassion, not for having done anything, and even when it's clear that he's misguided and lost. Jesus loves our earnest efforts towards him and towards his calling for our lives, even when it's incomplete and we fall short. Jesus is with us and for us and he calls us on. Discipleship is a journey for the rest of our lives, and we are beloved by God even when we feel like we're not there yet. But Jesus is also assuring us that there is so much more offered to us on the other side of the sacrifices that we make to follow him, that there is fullness of life beyond systems of power and domination. 